All right, we'll turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 17. And this evening we'll be looking at verses 8 through 20. But before I read the scripture, let me open us up in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for the offices that you have ordained and the spheres that you have ordained in all creation and not simply with your ancient people, Israel, but throughout all creation. Lord, we recognize on this Ascension Sunday that ultimately the office of king points to your son, Jesus Christ. We also recognize that this book is an unpacking of your law and that this is recognized to be part of the fifth commandment. And so we pray that you would help us to be more obedient by being more learned in your scriptures. Please send us the Holy Spirit to teach us your law. Help my words to serve that end and help us to attend to it and to apply it to all of life. We thank you for this and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 17. We looked at the wider section last week, but now we're honing in on... um, especially verses 14 to 20, but I'm going to read starting at verse 8 so you get the flow from the priests and judges to the kings. You get the whole section. Starting in verse 8. If any case arises requiring decision between one kind of homicide and another, one kind of legal right and another, or one kind of assault and another, any case within your towns that is too difficult for you, then you shall arise and go up to the place that the Lord your God will choose. You shall come to the Levitical priests and to the judge who is in office in those days. And you shall consult them, and they shall declare to you the decision. Then you shall do according to what they declare to you from that place that the Lord will choose. And you shall be careful to do according to all that they direct you, according to the instructions that they give you, and according to the decision which they pronounce to you, you shall do. You shall not turn aside from the verdict that they declare to you, either to the right hand or to the left. The man who acts presumptuously by not obeying the priest who stands to minister there before the Lord your God or the judge, that man shall die. So you shall purge the evil from Israel, and all the people shall hear and fear and not act presumptuously again. When you come to the land that the Lord your God has given you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver or gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a book of the copy of this law, approved by the Levitical priests, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. Title of the message this evening is God's Rule Over Human Rulers. Now you may have heard that the Bible has not much to say about proper form in government and civil law. This is false. As Old Testament scholar Richard Belcher summarizes this section, quote, the main characteristic of the role of the king within Israel is the limits placed on him. He is not the highest authority in the land. This role of the king was different from the way kings functioned in other nations in the ancient Near East, end quote. What we're going to get this evening, above all things, is this bit of doctrine. This is the big idea this evening, that God rules 
when the rule of law is over all men. God rules when the rule of law is over all men. So how you see the law relating to office holder, citizens, and so forth, which is a form of government, that will determine whether or not you worship God or man. And so right form of government, by rightly situating the law, is a worship issue. We'll see this in four ways this evening. First, God's law has justice as its eternal object. Secondly, God's law is supreme over all governmental forms. Third, God's law limits the magistrate as representative and servant. And fourthly and finally, God's law is to be the rule over the ruler. We'll see all four of those. First, God's law has justice as its eternal object. And for this part, I do want to zoom back out from 8 through 20, back to the wider section, especially the beginning where we started last week at the very end of chapter 16, is that we took one more broad look at the whole section. We'll see that the aim here is justice. That's how he started. That's his point. The word that's used in chapter 16, verse 18 and 19 is the Hebrew mishpat. And that word is going to have a couple of forms that are all going to be justice or judge related words. Here it's the noun. It's the abstract version, mishpat. But it's also the result, namely a judgment. And so for our English, and especially in our day and age where we can't do a whole lot of abstract thinking, we're discouraged from doing so, we might render this just judgment. So if you see the word in the Hebrew, you wouldn't see it in our English, you, mishpat, you, you might just render this judgment, just judgment. It's really what it's saying. For the Hebrew, they didn't have to say that. It was just a given. It was the point. What else would you want from a judge? An unjust judgment? So it's one idea here. He's doing justice rendering it. In fact, it was such a given that the words for officer and the action for judging that are also used in this section, they come from the same root. And so the sense of verse 18 is to appoint a uh, shofatim, or a shofari, a shofatim actually is plural for uh, somebody who renders a shafat, uh, justice. And so for us, we might think of justice as a really abstract thing, in one sense it is, that's not a bad thing, but that's what he was in the business of doing, is rendering these just judgments, these justices, say it like that. Because human laws were for justice, and therefore the job, the judge, was for justice. It's all pretty straightforward. But these human laws that were to result were to be based upon divine law. As we move out in the whole section in other words that are used, it was based, human law, on divine law. And that divine law that shows up in Scripture from the Holy Spirit through Moses' pen or Moses' voice on that day, that divine law was the inscripturated reflection of eternal law, that law as it is in God. If anybody thinks that this is too abstract or philosophical, verse 20 punctuates the section with this exclamation, justice and only justice you shall follow. In this case, the Hebrew word is not just that justice which is below these products of the judges, the thing that God appoints officers to act in, but rather now he uses a different word altogether, sadiq, which is the Hebrew word for righteousness. Now in Greek, there's only one word for it, dikaios. Justice and righteousness. In English, we have two words too, but we typically nowadays don't know what we're talking about, so it's almost not worth looking at. In Hebrew, you have these two different words, and there is nuance. But righteousness is an attribute of God before it's anything else. It's what God is. It's his character. Justice is itself a rule of conformity to that eternal attribute of God. And that attribute, Paul says, in Romans 2, 14 and 15, is something that through that law that he's written on the hearts, God has revealed to all Gentiles. All this law, 
Law in Israel, law among the pagans. There's a psalm for it, Psalm 82. Even the pagans are brought into God's court and he castigates them for not measuring up to his justice. Now, justice may be either nearly approximated and copied and get closer to the standard, or what we might call justice may increasingly deviate from that unchanging, immutable form as it is in God. And so verse 19, that verse in between, he uses both words. And we see how he says, you shall not pervert justice. That's mishpat. You shall not pervert that. And then he says, a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. And there it's in the plural, said a key. So the righteous ones maybe. Okay, and so you shall not subvert the cause of the righteous by perverting justice. This is the context. It's the context for both the rule of the judges and priests, and it would still be the context for the eventual rule of the kings. It doesn't cease to be the point of civil law when you replace the judges with the king. It is, as one commentator summarized verses 18, 19, and 20, justice and only justice shall you render. In other words, a couple of examples from history of what we're talking about here, human law measuring up through divine law in the Bible to eternal law, a couple of examples, famous ones. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote in his letter from a Birmingham jail, quote, how does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with that moral law. And then King says, to put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law, end quote. Would you be thinking about that when you're in prison? <laughs> it's right. It's biblical. Or even a pagan. Check this out. A pagan like Cicero. He understood when speaking of natural law. He said, quote, and there will not be different laws at Rome and at Athens or different laws now and in the future but ultimately one eternal and unchangeable law will be valid for all nations and for all times. And there will be one master and one rule that is God over us all. For he is the author of this law, its promulgator and its enforcing judge. Now a pagan knew that. Why don't Christians today? This was the explicitly Christian argument at the peak of Christian thought and for 20 centuries in making the case that every just human law is derived from eternal law, that it was a reflection of eternal law. Thomas Aquinas cited Proverbs 8.15 that says, By me kings reign and rulers decree what is just. And there the point was not God's sovereignty and his power, but rather his justice and righteousness. And earlier, Augustine had made the same argument. He said, all laws, insofar as they partake of right reason, are derived from the eternal law. So God's law has justice as its eternal rule. Secondly, here's the second thing we're going to get from this as we move more into our passage. God's law is supreme over all governmental forms. We see a change in government in the history of Israel. And God's law is supreme over both. God's instructions here belong to a consequent level of law. In other words, given their choices, no matter what Israel does, well, God's saying, I have a rule for that too. Given their choices, God graciously makes provision and it has a right way to it. He says in verses 14 and 15, now we're in chapter 17, starting in that section, it says, when you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. Notice he says, you know, I rather than we. Of course, the we, the mob, did it in 1 Samuel 8. But it's as if one voice, I will say this. 
Well, here's the formula to get here. Permissible, therefore provisional. He's not saying that will be a rebellion against me. Now, 1 Samuel 8, we find that it will. But he allows for it, and he provides. He provides law. And so we have to reconcile this fact. And this will be one of the more crucial things to get, one of the more controversial things in our day. It would not have been back in the day. God chooses the king. Reconcile that with the fact that the people chose the king. God would choose the king and the people would choose the king. And he's permitting. The past few generations among the Reformed have departed from the traditional Reformed view of divine law with respect to government. And one of the many results of this lack of civics education among the Reformed is an inability to process the weightier arguments made by the older thinkers, like Samuel Rutherford, for example, the Puritan Scottish divine in his book Lex Rex that he wrote in 1644. Rutherford spends a lot of time on this passage in Deuteronomy 17. Pages and pages and pages on this very point. First, about this text itself. Rutherford takes the statist position to argue their point for a second, and he imagines the people reacting incredulously to Moses and saying, to what end then should God mock us? In other words, if they had not had delegated authority to them to make kings, the text would make no sense. Rutherford proceeds to give 10 reasons that the people are higher than the king, all of which can be summarized in the principle. If the people give royal power to the king, then far more is the royal power in the people. Now, if you just cut into your Bible to Deuteronomy 17 and you skip Genesis 1 and skip Genesis 9 and skip Exodus 20, creation reaffirmed, and then the Ten Commandments. Those are those three markers. If you skip that and you cut in right here, well, that might sound very odd to you that the people have some right and that the king is representing that right. But it shouldn't be weird because the priests and judges already represented them before they barged in themselves and asked for a king. But if one is inclined to disagree with this idea, and they need to start untying this very knot. God makes kings, and the people made those same kings in every single case. Here in verse 15, both sides of the tension are stated in the same breath with no embarrassment. He says, you may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. But which is it? It's both. Now, one easy way out of thinking hard about this is to simply say, no, 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 all that means is that the people will choose to have kings in the first place. We see that in 1 Samuel 8. But then once they do, the divine right of kings flows directly from God to the king without respect to the people. Now, of course, that notion is a modern notion, but it was also ancient among the pagan nations where the king was God on earth. But it's reasserted itself in the modern world. And that idea has a lot more to do with Thomas Hobbes and his Leviathan than it does from the Bible. Because the classical Christian view is reinforced over and over and over again later in the Old Testament narrative by the people making kings under God making those same kings. Solomon made king by the people rather than Adonijah, saying, long live King Solomon in 1 Kings 139, and they performed that act. King David, 2 Samuel 5, 3, made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. 1 Chronicles 11, 2, same thing, same words, but adds, according to the word of the Lord by Samuel. So there you see God and the people making the king, and in that last text, you just have the additional, the prophet was the one who spoke these words. And so God's law remains supreme over all governmental forms. It doesn't go away under monarchy. 
even if it's a specially revealed monarchy as the Israelite monarchies were. Thirdly, God's law limits the magistrate as representative and servant. This will start to make some sense out of why uh, we can say that both God and the people made the king the king. God's law limits the magistrate as representative and servant. First, he represents his people. Verse 15, one from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Now, why your brother? Well, two reasons, one essential and the other pragmatic. It's essential because a representative only functions on behalf of those who are like him. This is central to the gospel. Think about it. It's the answer to the age-old question in theology, why the God-man? One half of the answer is that because man sinned, a man has to make things right. And so Christ represents his people by becoming like them. Well, in the same way, a king can only represent his people by being one of his people. But there's also a pragmatic reason embedded in the follow-up words, not a foreigner, one who is not your brother. Why? Why must he not be a foreigner? Well, why do you think? Have you ever seen the Manchurian candidate? I mean, just think about it for a sec. Very practical reason here. In the ancient Near East, this was an issue. If you came under the power of a greater power, your allegiance to that, what was called the suzerain, the greater king, meant that he would most likely choose your kings and so make you a vassal state. In other words, a servant to another nation and no longer to God. See, first commandment's always tied to this. It would be what we moderns call a satellite state or a puppet government. And what do we have here? He says, only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never turn that way again. In other words, he's striking a deal with the enemies. And why not? Benefits him personally. What's our argument against the king if he does anything like that? Well, God is telling the people, you must not allow him to do that. And again, I hear Rutherford's argument. What sense would that make if the people did not retain the right to punish him if he did so? But this law also has a concern that the civil servant be a servant. This is taught to Israel by means of a warning. The warning gives the opposite of a servant of the people. And you see this after the fact in 1 Samuel, when Samuel tells you, well, this is what this guy's going to do. And he wasn't just talking about Saul being a really naughty guy. This is, what, this is the way of the kings. But he says it here in Deuteronomy 17 as well, in verse 17. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver or gold. Now, in your mind, you might be flashing forward to all the different kings who fell short of all these things. Solomon had many wives, uh, Ahab, and that's exactly what happened, and so forth. And that's all true. But don't miss the principles, the horses, the harem, the treasury. What is all of this but a centralization of power? It was not the particular ugliness of Saul. It was not the particular weaknesses of Solomon. This was the way of the kings of the earth. This is the normal tendency of sinners accumulating power to themselves. This is the totalizing tendency of the state under statism. This is the deifying tendency of a magistrate who would do that. And the warning is clear. And the warning is not simply to the kings and to the judges. The clear sense of the words here is that the warning is to the people as a whole. Finally, fourthly, God's law is to be the rule over the ruler. And that might sound a little bit redundant, but it's what he has the king do here is really a stamp on everything else he said. God's law is to remain the rule over the ruler. He says in verse 18, and when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book, a copy of this law. Now, a lot of commentators think that's probably just Deuteronomy, but maybe not. 
Maybe it's a reflection of that. It's also Exodus 20. Or maybe the whole Torah. We don't know. When Solomon was in his phase of wisdom, what was his prayer as a king? There are Psalms of Solomon, and one of them is Psalm 72, where he says in verses 1 and 2, Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. There's that focus again. There's a king who gets it, who knows what he's looking at when he looks at the law. You see what this does? It makes the attributes of God and the actions of God the ruler's focus. This makes God the king's king, not one of the other kings around. Several of the commentators note, again, how the imagery is very suggestive of one of those suzerain treaties. In the ancient Near East covenant ceremonies, the conquering king would decree that a copy of the treaty be given to all the lesser vassal kings and be kept in their temples. And by giving that king who owed himself to the great king, by giving him a copy, this was really the great king's binding reminder of the terms and conditions. And so when the king of Israel was to make a copy, to write it by hand, to keep it, to read it, this was God's way of reminding him and everyone else that the king was his servant. Notice the primary place of the exegesis of law, the priests, the judges, they don't go away. It's a mistake to read Deuteronomy 17 and then say about 1 Samuel 8, Oh, that's when the judges and the priests are phased out. No, that's when the kings will take a position. But the judges and the priests will still be there. It says in verse 18, approved by the Levitical priests. What's approved by the Levitical priests? Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy is God's word. It's it's like, uh, how could they approve that? It just is what they accept it. No, this must mean that any of the laws have to be in pursuance of this law. How the king is writing it, perhaps, whether he's writing it, this is all approved by the Levitical priests. But here's the point. Where there is a distinct judicial branch, as we already saw last week that the priests and judges were, wherever there is a judicial branch, this is its design. Not to make up law, but to rightly discern that law which is, and to rightly discern which law is higher than another law within that system of law. It is God's law that the earthly ruler will always be under law. And so in verse 19, it shall be with him, and he shall read it, he shall read in it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them. One commentator compares this act to a child with his catechism. So that here, he says, quote, the king becomes the model Israelite and student of the law, as it were, a child in modeling the fear of the Lord and righteousness. This is really the ultimate civics education in Israel. And this sends the message that no one is above this standing law. The last part really drills home why this all belongs to moral law. It's not just civil law, and we'll see why. But in verse 20, it says that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers. Let me just stop right there. When does that happen? Just among Israelites? Is that just like a Jewish problem? Okay, no. So there's your first clue as to how to parse out moral and civil law. It's not just cherry picking or weird arbitrary nonsense that reform people say. It's a thing. That his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. So two reasons. One, that the magistrate is not above the citizen. Two, that the kingdom actually lasts. That's a good thing. Or to put those two another way, that the equal standing as as the image of God is a value. And the preservation of the image of God collectively 
That's the reason for all of this. Now, there's objections to all of this. Objection one is the one we just mentioned. This is civil law. And by that, I mean the civil law of Israel. It's not moral law, since it regards the monarchy under God. And so it regards the theocracy of the old covenant. Well, I grant that this is civil law in Israel of old by the letter. But we distinguish here. All of the traits here, and I read one and stopped for effect just to make that point. All of the traits here that we've looked at in Deuteronomy 17, these regard the image of God as such and not the particulars of the old theocracy. Everything we're talking about here, these tendencies and these flows of power, man under law, so on and so forth. These are moral law issues. These are image of God shaped, not priest of God shaped. It's how you tell the difference between something that's passed away in his priestly nation versus something that's continued. Objection two, and this is right from Lex Rex, word for word, the royalist objection. Quote, if the kingly power, I'll bring this into modern English. If the kingly power is of divine institution, then shall any other government be unlawful and contrary to a divine institution. And so we condemn aristocracy and democracy as unlawful, end quote. Have you ever had that thought? Well, the Bible says kings, therefore any other kind of government bad. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. However you put that or have heard that. That's the argument coming back from the royalists against the Puritans in that time. Rutherford's answer. They are not different governments morally and theologically. In other words, the monarchy, provided he's under a constitution and law, and a republic, where you have representatives and they're under law. Rutherford's saying those are not fundamentally different morally and theologically, but rather they're different politically and positively. Because he says aristocracy is nothing but enlarged monarchy. In other words, several of these dudes. And monarchy, nothing but contracted aristocracy. But either way, they are images of God, mere servants who represent the people under law. And besides, Rutherford says, whenever God appointed a king, he never appointed him absolute, but joined him always with judges. And he cites 2 Chronicles 19.6 and Deuteronomy 17.15. Objection three, bigger objection now, whole thing. Two problems with this view of Deuteronomy 17, moving to 1 Samuel 8, that from this judges 